Good morning, everybody. How are you all? I do hope that this broadcast finds you very well indeed. Down here on the south coast of the UK, we are enjoying the sunshine. The sun is out. I feel slightly hysterical about it, if I'm honest. I've um, been uh, tiptoeing around my garden at every possibility. The chickens are loving it. Uh, it's all good down here. So I hope wherever you are that the weather is being kind to you. So we have a Technique Tuesday broadcast with a difference this week, just in case you are new to Technique Tuesday. This is something that I bring to you every single week. Uh, we talk about all sorts of things. We've been working on projects. We've been working on them together, individually, all sorts of things. But I have some very big news coming your way today. So I thought what I would do is we'll do a couple of slightly different Technique Tuesdays in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, we've got some really big stuff coming up. So if you want to be some of the first to know about what it is that I've got coming up and the dates for your diary, off you go. Go grab a pen, go grab a piece of paper because I'm going to give you the dates in about 30 seconds time. But the first thing that I must do, which is much more important than anything else, if you are watching this live, you are watching this on Facebook via my Facebook professional page. And there are some of you in the room. There's quite a few of you in the room this morning. And it's very important to me that I say good morning to all of you. So who have we got? Linda D. Linda D wins the award for the first comment of the day. Uh, Janet. Uh, Patricia is in lovely Suffolk. She has a question. I'm going to uh, come back to that in just a second, if that's okay. Janice in Wales, good morning. Uh, Sue, Sue's supposed to be at work, but popped in. Denise, the lovely Denise Allen is in the room. Jean, Diane, Joe, Pam, Jean, Jean and Terry, my lovely, lovely friends, Jean and Terry are in the room. Uh, Jane, Joe, Jilly, lots of J's. Rabina and a Jill, just one more for good luck. Uh, Geraldine, Joy, uh, Yvonne, Anne, Maureen, Heather, Lynn. Um, all the Anns are in this morning, Angie, you're there too to uh, Kathy, good morning, Anne, Lynn, Hilary, uh, Jill is saying it's lovely and sunny in Exmouth, uh, Rosie over there in France, Gwenda just down the road from me, so I know it's sunny where you are Gwenda, uh, Christine, Viv, Chris, Jan, Anne, oh gosh you're all coming in thick and fast, Sandy, Carol, good morning lovely, I'm going to see you later in the week aren't I, haha. <laughs> Not telling them. Uh, Kareen, Trisha, Brenda and Janet. If I miss you saying good morning and hello, I do apologise. Uh, the comments come up a little bit thick and fast on Facebook. But please, if I don't say hello to you, that doesn't mean I'm not thinking about you and appreciate you tuning in. Ooh, we have Jane in the Isle of Man. How exotic. It's exotic for Dorset. Now, have you got your pen? Have you got your piece of paper? If not, quickly, go and get them, grab them. Grab something to scribble on, the dog, the cat, whatever it is. Uh, lots of uh, people still saying hello to me, Heather, Jean and Jilly. Now, dates for your diary. If you like following along with what I do and you're interested in the sort of slightly bigger picture of what I do. Mm, what does she mean by that? So not just necessarily about my tuition, but about the collections of work that I put together in terms of my own work, my own paintings. I have an extremely big event coming up and I would like you to know about it because no matter where you are in the world, you're going to be able to take part in it. Now, this is an event that was uh, sadly, sadly put to one side last year because of the pandemic, but it is going ahead this year and it's called Dorset Art Weeks. Dorset Art Weeks takes all of the artists who would like to take part in Dorset. Normally, we throw open our doors to the general public. We invite people to come up, have a look at our latest collections of work. In my case, it's a way of showcasing my work to be able to sell my paintings, to sell my greetings cards, uh, to talk to people about tuition, all of those kind of things. Now, it is the 22nd of May until the 6th of June. OK, write it down. 22nd of May, 6th of June. Now, why am I telling you about this if you're nowhere near Dorset or have no intention of venturing out yet? And that is because I have made the decision to put the entirety, not only in person, so if you are local, you can come up to the studio, you can, we can have a chat. I promise you it's very, very safe up here. I absolutely promise you that. Um, you can come up, you can sit in the garden, 
we can chat socially at a distance about anything that you would like to talk about but you guys out there have been incredibly supportive of me over the last year and so I want you to take part two so I'm putting the entire exhibition online now it's not a static thing it's not just a case of going to the website and looking at my work and going oh yes that's nice and it but i am putting on three weeks of events some live some written some pre-recorded and you guys out there are going to be able to take part in them if you want to know more about that as an event uh, there's more information about it in the blog post that i do every tuesday to follow on from this broadcast now oh dear so the coverage as far as uh, Dorset Art Weeks is concerned is going to start on the 11th of May even though I'm not technically starting Dorset Art Weeks until the 22nd there's going to be so much more information coming your way there's going to be so many exciting things that you can take part in and this is the bit I want you to write down Technique Tuesday Takeover that is what I'm going to be doing. I will have more information about that in the weeks to come. So stay tuned to my social media and to my website. There is so much that you can take part in. You have no idea. So for the next few weeks, Technique Tuesday is going to be a little bite-sized version of it so that it gives me a bit more time to kind of work up to that big event. I'm so excited about it. Now, there are some other dates uh, for your diary too. Sorry, I'm looking down my little cheat sheet. <laughs> Has to be done, otherwise I forget. Uh, 26th of April, next Monday, my classes for uh, July to December, everything that I'm going to be teaching, those bespoke workshops that I do, are going to go live on my website at 9am. Now there's lots and lots of ways that you can take part in a class. Little classes, big classes, runs of classes, workshops, all sorts of things. The best way for you to be the first person to hear about that is to sign up to my newsletter. Again, on the website, go over to the blog. There's more information about it there. And you could be an All Aboard Artist member for the rest of the year. You could take part in one of my online workshops. You could even come down to good old Dorset and you could have a face-to-face -face workshop with me. So pop over to the website, <laughs> website make sure you are signed up and uh, you'll get all the information that way. Now, lots of things have zipped on past me whilst I've been uh, talking about that. So uh, let me just do uh, a quick recap. Who have I not said good morning to? Trisha, Brenda, Janet, thank you. Uh, Jane, Jean, Jilly, hello Carol. Um, <laughs> you will see me on Thursday. Rosemary, Anita, good morning, lovely. Uh, Marion, uh, looks like she's in Wales, judging from the flag. Uh, Carol, uh, Lauren, uh, so she said, popped in to say hello, but have to work. We'll watch later. Thank you so much, as always, from South Africa. You are very welcome, Lauren, as always. Lovely D is in the room. Good morning. Uh, Carolyn, Ali D <laughs> is en route watching in a car. <laughs> I hope you're not driving. Christine, Geraldine, Julie, Maureen, Alison and Pippa. Oh, and Linda F just there on the end. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. If, you, if you've missed the information that I've just given you about dates for your diary, you can pop over to the blog and uh, read more about them. Or you can just, after this broadcast, you can rewind me. I'm not sure that anybody wants to do that, but you can rewind me. So I said on social media yesterday, didn't I? I said I was going to throw open the doors to you and uh, you get to ask me questions. So I'm going to start the ball rolling this week and talk about watercolour paper. But if you have a burning question, stick it into the comments. I can see that there's a question already gone out about gouache. I've had a couple of you, sorry, itchy nose. Um, I've had a couple of you already message me and email me with very specific questions. I'm going to try over the next few weeks to uh, answer those for you. But also use the chat, use the Learning to Paint with Alison Seaboard Facebook page for this lovely artistic hive mind that we have. There's already been some questions gone up there today and and you lovely people have answered. Uh, lots of people saying good morning. I uh, don't want to miss anyone. 
Uh, right, okay, this is a very quick uh, question I can answer. Heather, and I'm sorry whoever asked it, uh, who asked it earlier? I can't remember who asked it. My apologies if I missed it. About gouache. Uh, some of you may have seen my uh, gouache broadcast that I did uh, last week on the Craft Store television channel, which I believe is still available on Catch Up on their website. You can go back and watch that. Um, the In terms of, uh, Heather is asking what's the best gouache to buy. And that's a bit like saying what's the best washing powder to buy because everyone's going to have a personal preference. I really like the Dale Rowney one. Dale Rowney do two versions of it they do their designers gouache and they do their aquafine gouache for me don't particularly get on with their aquafine gouache it's too thin for me i prefer the designers gouache and they've got some really delicious colors too gouache is a painting medium in its own right but you will probably see in any of the workshops that i do or a lot of the demonstrations that i do i tend to sort of sneak it in as a bit of an addition to anything else that i'm doing it will always crop up in my work because i just love it so and it's the thing that i taught myself to paint with so that's why it uh, it has a, a bit of a special place in my heart um jilly is asking about ash paper good morning ronald um lynn is uh, asking about gouache so uh lynn you're very welcome lynn emailed me yesterday with a question which i was very happy to reply to and yes you can watch this broadcast back so if you go over to the videos tab on my facebook page or much much more easily than that go over to my website look at the blog and all of the broadcasts that i ever do like this are all archived there so you can go back through hours of fun make a, a very very large uh, cup of coffee to scroll back through all of those uh, lots of people have so many questions coming in. I'm loving it. I'm going to get not necessarily this week, but in the next couple of weeks, I will get to some of them. People asking about I always get very tight when trying to paint. Do you ever stand up when you squeeze paint out of the tubes? How do you let them dry? Uh, Rosie's asking uh, technical questions about scanning. Oh, all sorts of things. Get them in the comments because I'm going to go back through those comments. I'm going to try to uh, get them all together for you so that I have a way of answering answering as many as I possibly can. Uh, Gwen is, uh, I'm hoping having her hair cut rather than cutting somebody else's. Let us know, Gwen. Um, but uh, obviously I'm broadcasting live from hairdressers somewhere. Who knew that was a thing? But watercolour paper, watercolour paper. I'm going to take you to the overhead camera so that you can see uh, some of the uh, examples that I've got here and then you can get your uh, questions in. So um, if you want to learn a little bit more about watercolour paper, I'm going to kind of summarise a video that is actually on my website. It's a very long video. You are going to need a cup of coffee and a deep breath before you watch it because I do get very technical uh, on that video but under the resources section of my website you'll be able to I think it's called something like how to choose watercolor paper or understanding watercolor paper but it is on there you can sit there I'd sit there with uh, a piece of paper and a pen to take some notes if I were you because it does get very technical I'm going to give you just an overview of some of the some she says of the watercolor papers that I have in my stash and the thing that I want you to understand and if you are taking notes this morning I want you to write this in very large letters on your piece of paper it's only ever someone's opinion okay it's only ever someone's opinion because for every art tutor that tells you that you must use this paper you'll get another art tutor that says you must use this type of paper okay so it is only personal preference it is down to the style of painting that uh, you do which you might not necessarily know right now it is trial and error and it doesn't matter no matter what i say about watercolor paper if you've got a brand of watercolor paper that you get on with really well then stick with it okay right i'm just pausing it's ever so slightly because i need to put my glasses on otherwise i'm never going to see right the first two papers i have uh, for you are two that come from the saa these are practice papers they mean what they say the idea is that you can practice techniques on them but I wanted to uh, put these into shop for you because what the SAA do rather brilliantly is give you a lot of information 
And it is a good idea to start to understand the information that is given to you on your pad of paper. Don't just look at the pretty picture, even if it's one of my pretty pictures. Don't just look at the pretty picture. Have a look at the information that is given to you on the pad because it will help you make a decision. Now, this is uh, something that I've had in the past where it's been in loose sheets, but the information up here is very, very useful. Again, I will talk more about it in that long video on the website, but just to give you a bit of an overview. Um, up, so you've got the number of sheets up here. Here is the weight of the watercolour paper. Now, again, I talk more about it, more about the weight, but the weight doesn't necessarily tell you how thick something is. OK, that is the first bit of information that may be news to you. It will give you a rough guide, but it isn't the be all and end all of the thickness. If you think about it logically, you can have two things that weigh exactly the same, but one might be uh, puffier, thicker, more bulk. The other one might be thinner and lighter. It does give you a guide, but it's not the absolute uh, measurement for the thickness of the paper. And here in the UK, we tend to work with two types of measurement because we're awkward. We either have a gram weight, so this is 300 grams, grams per square meter, GSM, or we have a pound weight, so this is 140 pound. That is the weight of a ream of the paper in imperial size. So £140 is not what it costs, £140 is not what it weighs in a single sheet. That is the weight of a ream. So a ream of paper is 480 to 500 sheets. And uh, those are imperial size sheets. So they are 30 by 22 inches. OK, and that's a lot to get your head around, isn't it? It took me ages. And then over here, you've got the size of this piece of paper. Again, we are in between both metric and imperial. So this is saying that it's quarter imperial, which is uh, 11 by 15 inches, because a, an imperial size sheet is 30 by 22. But you also have it there in millimetres as well, um, 280 by 380. OK, so uh, those are very useful bits of information to do with size and weight, particularly useful if you are ordering online and you don't really kind of understand what something might look like. We're visual creatures, aren't we? We want to know what something looks like. OK, over here on the right hand side is some extra bits of information that the SAA think is going to be useful to you. And it certainly is. What is the paper made of? I'm not going to go into this at length because I could talk to you for half an hour about this and I'm not going to do that to you, all right? Let it be known that you get different ingredients in watercolour paper. This one is made from cellulose. Go away, Google what cellulose is in paper making. Um, I don't have the best working knowledge as far as cellulose is concerned, but generally speaking, you either get uh, wood-free wood pulp, cellulose or cotton, that kind of description. Those are the things you are looking for. Generally speaking, the higher the cotton content, the more um, thinking time you have on the surface, the more absorbent it's going to be, the more the colour will float on the surface but like I say you'll get another art tutor that tells you a completely different story so you need to go and find out for yourself buy a pad of uh, paper or a mixed pack of watercolour paper in order to test these things out acid free you want it to be acid free you don't want any kind of optical brightness you don't want it to be over white you don't want it to do something called foxing which is where you get those little rust spots in your paper you want it to last so that if you create uh, a really beautiful painting you don't want it to start falling apart when you put it on the wall and up here you've got an iso number as well for uh, the conservation qualities of it down here you have uh, the surface so this is a rough surface. Generally speaking, there are three surfaces of watercolour paper. There's hot pressed, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, which is smooth, passed between heated rollers to make it uh, very smooth indeed. So that's hot pressed, HP. That is uh, also a description. You get rough, which is funnily enough rough. And then you get the Goldilocks version, which is called Knot. Why is it called not? It's called not, N-O-T, because it's not hot pressed and it's not rough. What it actually should be called is cold pressed. 
And then if I take you over to this little block of paper here, which is another of the SAA's practice paper, got all of that information again for you. And then down here at the bottom, you can see very important cold press. That's the official name of it, not surface. OK, I can see that um, Pippa has just come up with a question asking, can you put a lot of water on the SAA practice paper? In my experience, Pippa, it doesn't take as much water as the cotton papers. However, you can wet it front and back. So you can wet it on the front, flip it over, wet it on the back, and that actually gives you a bit more painting time. Now, what I did was pull out of my uh, watercolour paper archive some other things uh, for us to look at that might interest you, you might have, you might um, have a, a much more of an association with. So here is uh, quite a popular pad. This is the Langton. This is made by Dale Rowney. Um, again, lots of information, but you kind of have to search for stuff. So here's the weight, 140 pound, 300 gram. Um, there we go, hot pressed in several different languages, none of which I can speak. Hot pressed uh, here, smooth, so that tells you that it's smooth. Uh, down here you've got the size, the number of sheets, it being acid free, all of those types of things. So you can glean an awful lot of information from the front of your pad. Uh, here you've got a Derwent watercolour pad. Uh, Derwent make their pads pretty much specifically for their products. So it's probably designed for pencil or pen or ink or the like. And again, you can see the same type of information, superior smooth surface. Here they quite helpfully tell you the kind of media that might be useful on it. Uh, pencils, brushes, the size, the number of sheets, the weight and acid free. So, um, that again is quite useful and usually the image that they put on the front of the paper has been painted on it or is indicative of the type of work that you can expect uh, to come out. So you can see you've got really crisp lines in the watercolour here. It obviously takes colour really well because it's nice and bright, all of those kind of things. Now Rona has just asked a really sensible question. Hi Ali, I've just joined you this morning. You're very welcome, good morning. My question is, is there a front and a back to paper and if so, how do you know? Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, I'm going to go back to head on shot so that you're not talking to my hands. Uh, Rona, there's much discussion about the front and the back of watercolour paper. My overriding piece of advice is not to worry too much about it. Again, you'll get conflicting stories. Google it. You will get some people that say to you, oh, you must never use the back, which I agree with you. Like you say, well, that'd be great if you could tell which is the front or the back. If you have an art teacher, hand them your piece of watercolour paper and ask them which is the front and the back because most of the time it is down to experience and understanding the watercolour paper. It's very difficult to tell at a distance. If you held a piece of watercolour paper up to me, I might ask you a series of leading questions that would help you to be able to deduce which is the front and the back. But for the most part, I have very often said to people, oh, I only use the front of a piece of watercolour paper and then looked at a painting and I've done it on the back and I didn't notice and it didn't make any difference at all. So try not to worry too much about it. It's one of those things that you can get really kind of uptight about and I genuinely don't think it matters an awful lot but other people may tell you different. Uh, Alison's saying, uh, I get frustrated with the different sizes of different makes of paper and trying to match them with mounts. Nothing seems standard, but maybe that's just me. No, it's not. Um, the, the problem, uh, this is such a big question as well, Alison. Um, the problem is as well that uh, you have to make a decision about whether you are painting to fit a frame which is quite restricting but cuts down on cost or you just paint the picture and then you get it framed professionally and that's a whole different discussion to be had however slight heads up that is something that I'm going to be talking about during Dorset Art Weeks. All right. So you just got to hold that thought if that's OK. Uh, I've seen pads that say gummed edges. What does that mean, please? Lynn, sometimes uh, pads are called blocks and they glue them all the way round to stop the paper buckling. I don't get on with them myself. I paint very wet and it still buckles on me. But again, you'll get lots of artists out there that uh, suggest that you work in a block just for ease of use, all those sorts of things. 
Um, oh, Rona, you are kind. Um, uh, ah, Gary's in the room. Uh, morning, Ali. Sup? Good morning, Mr. Templeman. Have you noticed any changes in your painting during lockdown? Has it given you more time to experiment? That's a really good question, Gary. I think I'm going to answer that one really quickly. Um, the changes in my uh, painting have been that I've actually had to embrace a lot more media in my work because of uh, lots of people being able to access me now. It sounds like a bad thing, um, but uh, have I had more time to experiment? Not a single second. <laughs> because I've been very fortunate and lots of people have uh, been able to access what I do, so I haven't had as much time to experiment as I would do ordinarily. However, um, as we get eased back out of lockdown again, I'm hoping that will change a little bit. I've set some time aside uh, to do some experimenting for myself because as soon as I uh, have experimented and discovered something new, then you guys will too. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Morning, everybody. So let's head back to that watercolour paper, shall we? And I'll share some uh, more things with you. So that's the Derwent one. Now, here are, um, sorry, that was wrapped in plastic, which is why it's glaring in the light. Here are two of my watercolour pads. Now, I don't do this just because I want my name on a watercolour pad. It would be a bit daft of me to put my name to a watercolour paper if it wasn't something that I used and wasn't something that I uh, particularly find works for my techniques. These are the two that I use. So this is Milford. This is uh, a recipe that the St Cuthbert's Mill have come um, up with in a replication of a watercolour paper that Turner used to use called Watman. Um, this is St Cuthbert's Mill's, this is the St Cuthbert Mill version of that paper. It's very soft, you can float the colour for a long time on it to get these kind of very soft ethereal looks on the paper. So that's uh, one of my favourites. But my ultimate all time favourite has to be good old Saunders Waterford. Why do I love it so? The primary reason for loving it as much as I do is that I can do whatever I want to it. Mixed media, collage, acrylic, ink, brusho, textures, you name it, I can chuck it at this paper and it never ever lets me down. It doesn't absorb as much colour as uh, papers such as Arsh and Fabriano, it floats the colour, the colours dry a little truer for my liking. Um, and what I thought I'd do is I've got uh, a rather lovely swatch that uh, Saunders Waterford let me have so that you can kind of see some of the variations of paper. Saunders Waterford is just an overriding name but they come in different weights and they come in different surfaces. So uh, let's find you some versions of things. I also want to find you, I think these are all high white because Saunders Waterford also do traditional white. So here is the traditional white, got a slightly creamier version to it. And then this is the high white. So can you see the difference between the two? Now that's not to say that one is superior to the other. So for example, I much prefer the traditional white paper if I want something to look very, very white on it. So if I want to use white gouache or white pen, any of those kind of things, those will show up much better than they will do on the high white. But if I'm using masking fluid, then of course I want something to probably stay super white, so I might use the high white instead. Um, Pippa is asking, is your watercolour paper different to the Saunders Waterford that you get from the SAA? Uh, no, just that it's more convenient and if you don't like the decal edge, that's been trimmed off and in pad format too. Uh, Anita saying, I'm a Bockingford 425 girl, which use much more than a cotton paper. And this is the thing, Anita, isn't it? You've got the experience of lots of artists in the room today who will absolutely tell you that the paper that they use is the one to go for. And this is what I mean. Take everything that we say with a very large pinch of salt because we've developed the way that we work on the paper that we work with and there's a reason for it okay just in the same way you might use one type of pen over another type of pen one brand of washing powder over another brand of washing 
washing powder it's just your experience carol is saying saunders waterford has always been my favorite paper others just don't work for me as i like to work loose and that's it carol isn't it that's it in a nutshell so uh here you've got uh, i just wanted to show you this a much heavier sample of uh, saunders waterford so this is a 300 pound 638 gram so uh really quite heavy indeed going to take an awful lot of water that and a rough surface you can probably see it um let's just get a close-up camera in on the mix so that you can see the texture of that rough paper going on there julie says sometimes the cost may, may be a factor in purchasing paper yes julie you're absolutely right my only piece of advice would be buy the best paper that you can afford because you can uh, absolutely get away with slightly cheaper brushes and slightly cheaper paint but it's rare that you will get away with slightly cheaper paper so if you're going to upgrade out anything i've lost count of the number of times i've seen somebody working with a lower grade of paper i've given them a sheet of saunders waterford to try they haven't changed anything in the way that they've applied the paint but the result um, is much more pleasing in the application of the color and uh, also in that kind of aesthetic that you get if particularly if you're using watercolors that kind of lovely edges or lost and found or all of those things that us watercolor tutors bang on about incessantly so i thought i'd just uh, as we come to uh, close today i thought i'd just share a couple of other things like i'm tidying while i'm broadcasting that's not a good thing um uh, what have we got? There's some things coming up. Uh, yes, people saying uh, that they like the Saunders Waterford, that they like Bockingford. Anne says, with unidentified papers, is it worth using a watercolour ground before painting? Not always, Anne. Not always. It depends. Uh, you can, you know, you just uh, find a, an edge of it, test out your colours, see how it works. Janet's asking, can you use a glued pad sheet separately to paint on? Yes, I do that all the time. Susan's saying, I'm so nervous about using my expensive paper. I keep going back to SAA practice paper. Susan, I get that. I absolutely get that. And I know that you've come to uh, a couple of my uh, workshops, or more than a couple of my workshops, um, but you know my opinion on that, that if you, let's just say, for example, you went out and you wanted to get all the ingredients to buy a cake. I'm just going to... Otherwise, you're just looking at my hands again. You go out uh, to the supermarket and you get all the ingredients to buy a cake, right? And you buy uh, value price flour, value price eggs, all of that kind of stuff. You think, oh, I'm just practicing, okay? And you make that cake and it's okay. It doesn't kind of necessarily turn out brilliantly, but it's all right. And you think, okay, I've mastered my techniques now. So now I'll go and get the really good stuff. I'll buy much better flour, eggs, you are changing the parameters of what's happening and therefore you're changing the science of what's happening. So you might go from very cheap eggs to something that your chickens laid in the back garden. The actual makeup of that is different and so the outcome will be too. Now that can sometimes be a plus point, but it can also be a hindrance sometimes too in that actually if you'd practiced with the actual thing that you're going to do your finished cake piece, I'm using lots of analogies this morning, on, then uh, not too much changes all the time. I absolutely understand your reticence to use expensive paper. The only thing I can tell you is that Saunders Waterford or papers of that caliber, you can paint on the front and the back. So I, you will see many a time. In fact, my husband is uh, framing my Dorset Art Week's work at the moment. He keeps saying about the back of pictures, he keeps going, well, why haven't you framed this? Why are you framing the other side? And it's because I use fronts and backs all the time. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, try not to be scared, my lovely, because, uh, you know, that just have a gin <laughs> get a gin down yet be fine uh what else uh Anne, i had a tutor once that said always use the best paper as you never know when you'll produce a pleasing painting couldn't agree with you more and again just my opinion ruth says uh she's going to catch up uh <laughs> later um pippa's uh, saying things 
Uh, so Susan is saying that she obviously shops in Lidl. Good, wouldn't like to comment. <laughs> right, let's uh, let you into uh, a couple of other things I wanted to share with you before we part company today. This is Two Rivers Paper. Two Rivers Paper is another paper that I particularly enjoy using. It is handmade and it is incredibly beautiful. And if you thought Saunders Waterford was scary, Susan, you wait till you get hold of this stuff. I mean, this is this makes watercolour painters just want to weep, it's so beautiful. Look at those decal edges on there, aren't they lovely where it's been made in a mould? It's beautifully heavy, it's got a very uneven, a surface so you're getting, going to get all sorts of random marks which are very lovely that's a paper that you'll see me use often in fact <clears throat> in the last edition of paint magazine for those of you that get paint magazine I did a portrait of Archie my husband's uh, recent ride in liquid charcoal and used two rivers paper for that because I was using alcohol to disturb the charcoal and I knew that this was going to stand up to it. Equally we've got uh, what is sometimes referred to as a Cardi, K-H-A-D-I paper which again is handmade and uh, really interesting to experiment with and very soon in this edition of Paint Magazine that is coming out you will see me working with an agave paper so something else to think about. There's lots out there. There's lots out there. Again, doesn't mean we're right. Doesn't mean everybody else is wrong. It's just what we do. Now this, 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 this. I wanted, <laughs> lots of people want my paper. Uh, this I uh, came across in the box because it's a very old piece of paper. Now this, I have a, a sort of a scraps box of when I use a piece of paper and I chop the edge off or for some reason, as you can see, it's got really grubby. Um, it, uh, it sort of goes in the scraps box. Now, I know, morning Tony, um, I know that this piece of paper has to be at least 10 years old, just because I have, I can't remember what I did last week, but I can remember bits of art materials and when I use them. So this is a, a relatively old piece of watercolor paper. And actually there is a discussion where lots of people will tell you that old watercolour paper is better than new watercolour paper. I disagree with that myself and here is the reason why I disagree with it. Now on face value that piece of watercolour paper looks fine and dandy doesn't it? Looks okay, it looks I mean apart from the grubby bits and the line and all the rest of it it looks like oh yeah I'll, I'll have a go with that that's okay but I noticed and you can see this in the camera can you see that kind of yellowish tinge that's down one edge? Can you all see that? If you can see that, tell me that you can see it <laughs> so that I know that you can see what I'm seeing. There's just a very faint yellow bit on that corner. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you two things. One is that has been exposed to the atmosphere in some way that might have been left in the sunlight, might have been poking out. Yes, lots of people can see it, marvellous. Um, uh, it might be that uh, it's kind of got humid, all of those kind of things. I tell you exactly what that tells me. That tells me that the sizing, so that's the stuff that stops your watercolour paper acting like blotting paper. If it was just the fibres, uh, and you painted on it, your paint would sink into the surface, you'd never shift it in a million years. So paper is sized. So that can be sized in the pulp before the paper is made, or it can be surface sized. That tells me that the sizing is starting to break down. And if I paint on this piece of paper, I'm gonna get a very disappointing mark. It's gonna revert back to that blotting paper. Because the sizing that's used is, generally speaking, a natural product, it does break down over time. So old watercolor paper does not necessarily mean better. If it's been stored really well, kept really well, and air has been allowed to circulate over the sheets, it'll be fine. But if you notice that yellow tinge on a piece of paper, beware. Okay, just beware. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so that is something to just look out for. Now, 
uh people saying they've got lots of old paper um susan saying she's got some cardi paper susan use it use it use it use it morning martina um lynn what's lynn saying when i'm over my surgery can i please come and live with you and be your laborer so i can learn on the job <laughs> Anytime, Lynn. You're always very welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I'm hoping that all of that information uh, has been uh, useful to you this morning. Like I said, I go into it in much more depth and detail over on my website. You can either find that video under the resources tab, or if you want to add a little bit of extra colour to this morning's broadcast, go over to the blog, alisonseaboard-fineart.co.uk forward slash Ali's hyphen blog. Then you will see the latest post. I'll archive this broadcast as well over there and on YouTube as well. And that will give you all the links to all the things that I have talked about today. It'll give you the links to the Dorset Art Weeks information. It will give you the links uh, to the video, all sorts of stuff there for you to enjoy. Uh, what do I need to do to, uh, to round everything up? So much to think about this morning. Now, these Bite Size Technique Tuesdays are going to continue until the 11th of May. The 11th of May will be the first of the Dorset Art Weeks broadcasts and then lots and lots of weeks of content how I paint, why I paint, inspiration behind paintings, insight into how to put an event on of the scale that I'm about to put on at the end of May. Lots of things for you to take part in. They will always be available on Catch Up, either via the blog or via my social media. If you have another question that you would like me to tackle in the weeks to come, I'm going to go back over some of them as well, just in case there are people who've missed this week's broadcast. We'll talk more about inspiration, we'll talk more about any other materials uh, let's just have taken my glasses off so the chances of me reading your comments are slim uh, lots of people are uh, saying uh, that today's been helpful which is great uh, so get those questions coming in if something uh, occurs to you in the middle of the night stick it over on the learning to paint with Alison Seaboard Facebook page send me a message send me an email downendfarmstudio at gmail.com and I will try my very, very hardest to include it in the next couple of broadcasts. Until I see you next week, I've got, what have I got coming up this week? I've got a bit of tuition to do. Uh, I've got lots of meetings this week, um, but mostly getting prepared for all those classes launching on my website on Monday. If you have any questions about those, there will be a video being put out about all the different kinds of tuition that I offer. Uh, just to help you with your choices, whether you want to join me for a day online or a day in person, whether you want to be part of the All Aboard Artists uh, art group, whether you want to just join me for an evening, any of those kind of things. Hopefully uh, I've put on enough so that I can get to know you a little bit better, help you with your individual artwork a little bit better. I would love to see you in a class. Those, goes live, those go live on Monday morning at nine o'clock UK time. If in the meantime you need me for anything, uh, you know where to find me. But in the meantime, take lots and lots of care of yourselves and each other. Keep painting, keep splashing that old paint around, keep experimenting, and I will see you very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>